Today we'll be talking with the founder of Zoe's Cookies and Other Delights, named Richmond Business of the Year in 2012. Today they employ 22 people, operate an 8,100 square foot facility, and sell over 80,000 cookies, brownies, and fruit bars a week. But it wasn't always this way. Here to share with us what she has learned along the way is Zoe Smith. Hi. Hi, thanks for being here. You're welcome. So early on, you started out, you didn't have a business background, but, uh, but you started baking cookies. What, how did you know how to bake? I learned from my mom, and I started learning about bakeries when I was around four years old. My mother was a single mom for quite some time, had three children to take care of, and she worked in a bakery in Tempe, Arizona called the Vienna Bakery. Before I started nursery school and kindergarten, I was there all day long. And then when I did start school, I'd come there after school. And that's where I spent all my away from home hours in this old Vienna bakery. I remember walking into the back and they'd have this wooden, a wooden trough, which of course would never ever be allowed these days, but they'd be raising their bread dough in this long wooden trough. Now, I was little, okay, so it looked to me like it was about 20 feet long. <laughs> it was probably like five feet long, I don't know. And I can remember walking past it, and I could smell the yeast, and, you know, I could see the dough puffing up in this big trough. You and probably even put your fingers in it. I probably did. <laughs> what happens? I learned how to count in the bakery, I learned how to sort things by the dozen and uh, fill orders mm -hmm. because Gus, the owner of the bakery, also did, in, in addition to his retail, he did wholesale. He sold oatmeal raisin cookies to the schools, things like that. So I had no idea that that was just, that would stay with me for so long, but I discovered that, uh, especially during college, I liked to bake oatmeal raisin cookies and I'd bring them out to the sculpture hut. and share cookies with everybody wow. and I just always loved to bake so when I was looking for a way to take care of my daughter and not have to go back to my old job it was a natural thing for me to just go oh, I'll just sell cookies right. I'll sell them this time instead of giving them away so I started um, baking products at my house and selling at the Ashby Flea Market in Berkeley um, so I did that for several weekends Maybe a few months I did that, and I didn't know anything about health department regulations. I just knew I needed to make some money, and so I um, was kicked out of the Berkeley flea market because I didn't have a health permit, and I didn't know I was supposed to have one. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that, that was my first learning experience. So I called the health department to get my health permit, and then I found out that I wasn't allowed to bake at home and sell to the public. Um, so that was was difficult. So actually what I ended up doing, which I don't advise people to do things like this, but I did because I had a baby to support. I, I snuck around, basically, and I got some commercial accounts in Richmond, uh -huh. little cafes and such, and continued baking out of my kitchen. I did that for nine months, and then I actually did get a visit from the health department one morning. Um, they came knocking at your door? Literally, Literally, yes, they were on my front porch. Thank goodness I wasn't baking at the time. Yeah, the smell. Oh, I'm not baking. We can't. Can I hardly bake? Well, that. I did. I said, <laughs> you know, no, I don't bake here. I, you know, I have a friend in San Francisco who has a deli, which I did, and um, I rent space from him. <laughs> and, and it was the truth, but I, you know, anyway, they said, well, you don't have a health permit and you don't have a business license. You need those, bef you know, et cetera, yeah. all of that stuff. So it was just horrible just horrible and I knew they were coming because one of my customers called me and she said "Zo, they're on their way they know where you live now I you know <laughs> they've you're busted and so you uh, do, did at that point you said okay I've got it I've got to change yeah it took me a little while to figure out how to do it what I ended up doing was I started renting space from other bakeries in the area my first uh, the first place I rented was a little tiny cookie shop in Albany called Tough Cookie. Okay. And she was doing so poorly that she actually rented space to me and two other cookie companies. And all of us were after the same customers. Wow. You know, it was um, not great. 
to be in there. I eventually moved out to a Mexican bakery in San Pablo, stayed there for a while. So originally, though, it was like you and somebody else both going after the same customers, so it's almost like a bake-off. Yeah, it was like, don't leave your recipes around, don't leave your customer list in here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were friendly to each other, but knowing that we were all after the same customers. So Tough Cookie, what happened at Tough Cookie, and the reason I left is that one of the companies that was renting space ended up taking over the lease. Oh, okay. And the original leaseholder, uh, owner of Tough Cookie, she just got out of the business. Um, and this company, whose name I won't mention, um, kicked me out in the middle of a bake. Just They told me, you can finish one more bake here. So I was in the middle of it. And then they came in and changed their mind and decided, <laughs> we want you out now. I'm going, what do you mean you want me out now? I'm baking. You know, it was just a nightmare. And so um, I moved to a bakery in San Pablo and baked there for less than a year. It wasn't very long, maybe six months. And from there, I went to um, Black Muslim Bakery okay. in Oakland and stayed there for a couple of years. Um, so when, when, when you got kicked out of the first place, mm -hmm. presumably you had orders and people expecting them. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to get a, a, an account set up with someone else? Um, you know, I think I must have already made the arrangements to move into okay. this Mexican bakery because they were telling me, you can have this one more day to bake, and I'm going, fine, and then I'll move. So I think I had it already arranged. So you were able but to it was transition, just very, but it was shocking. Yeah. It was shocking what they did. So Black Muslim Bakery, I stayed there for a couple of years. I went from having one part-time employee to when I left, I had, I think, five part-time employees and uh, found a space. And the, the employees are all uh, helping bake? Or, they know. were mixing. Um, at that time, the employees that I had, we all of us, we mixed, we baked, we packed, and we all delivered. Okay. So but, you know, no, we were doing everything. You hadn't hired a bookkeeper or an accountant or a marketing no, person? Or no, a, I didn't even have any insurance. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I remember reading a book somewhere. They said the first person to hire is your accountant. And I'm like, really? Yeah, no, I didn't hire an accountant for years. <laughs> oh. I just did everything myself. So you moved. So you, you were at the Black Muslim Bakery with five employees mm -hmm. for? A couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started with just one employee. And then, you know, by the time I left, they were very happy to see me go because I was kind of spreading out, you know, oh, I could bring in another table. I brought in my own mixer, you know. <laughs> they had me shoved off into a corner. So uh, I found a place over on Marina Way South, and right off of Cutting Boulevard. We started off with just uh, 5,300 square feet, took on a little bit extra, the um, 8,100 now, and this summer we'll be adding another 2,500 wow. square feet. So In the same, know, er, it's the same yeah, facility. Yeah, right next door to us. <laughs> That's great. It's available. The landlord said, do you want it? And I said, Sure. Yeah, you know, t t yeah. T when you when you went looking for your first place, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, if I'm hearing correctly at this time, you're you're at five employees, no insurance, and you're just thinking no. about moving, right? So, <laughs> how do you know what were your primary concerns when you're looking for a space at that time? You know, I just needed a big open space, and I found one. It was with a uh, kitchen, or nope, no? nope. Have to do it's you know, it's just empty building. Wow. So I I had to. Um, do all of the tenant improvements wow. and you know again I was always undercapitalized and so what I, I found contractors who were kind enough never met me before but they let uh, several of them let me take 12 months to pay them Wow! they gave me a whole year because I at that time still couldn't get a bank loan okay um, so that's how I got into my first place so and, you were in a sense financed by your contractors yeah Wow. A lot of it was. And, but you had to buy equipment, too. Yes, uh, I'd been saving for equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I may have had a little bit stashed in the basement of my house. I can't quite remember. And I borrowed some money from a couple of friends. Mm -hmm. and they waited until I could pay them back. I mean, I was really fortunate in that people had faith in me. Right. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yes. Uh, yeah, f financing is a, uh, is a, is a, a tricky tricky one it is and, but, but but doing it through contractors is kind of something I think I think a lot of people probably don't think about I don't I don't know if how many contractors would do that now yeah I don't know any contractors who would do that for me now yeah well yeah well, <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't look like you're struggling as right, much, right? right. <laughs> I can't give them that story like I don't have any money how huh? but I need you to do this for me so I guess one of the questions is when you first, so when you first started out, you mm -hmm. were selling it at Berkeley, mm -hmm. and then what, how did you, how, what was your marketing plan to sell 
as you as you grew? I mean, what did, did you start out with a marketing plan and figured out how you'd market? I never had a marketing plan. Here was my plan. Okay. Put together some sample boxes, type up a price list, and take them out to places that you want to have your cookies in. Literally driving? Yes, walking driving. In. Yes. And when I first started, I had my baby on my back. Wow. And I'd walk in with my daughter on my back and say something stupid like, I have some really good cookies. Would you like to buy them from me? And I'd show them my stuff. So this is the script, the winning, <laughs> the winning sales script. And, you know, I had never done anything like that before, so I, I was really nervous. And I'd have to sit, you know, I'd pull up to, say, like, Little Louie's in Point Richmond. He was my first customer. Oh, really? Yes. He's still there. They're still there. Good car the life. original owner isn't there, <laughs> Tony. He sold to his, his uh, partner. But Tony was great. You know, I walked in with Nia on my back, and I had a, a whole jar of cookies, and showed them to him, and um, I think a couple of days later, he said, yes, yeah, I'll oh. sell your cookies here. So that was my very first commercial account. How many was he buying from you at that oh, time? Oh, I don't remember. You know, it ended up to be a really good account, especially when he got the catering um, orders from Chevron. Mm. Um, you know, over the years, it, got, it grew to be a really big account. I see. So. But, you know, probably a few dozen or something like that? Or? Yeah, like, yes. The first stores would, you know, if they sold a couple dozen in a week, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I had low overhead right, right. when I was working out of my house. Right, low, right. Really low overhead. And then, and so as you grew, uh, you, how did you, how did, how did that change? Well, um, as I grew and moved into commercial space, I had to pay rent. Of course, I had to get insurance, mm -hmm. uh, workers' comp insurance, liability, auto insurance, all of those things. Right. And so I had to raise my prices. Um, and it was still good. You know, people were willing to pay whatever it was I was charging at the time for the quality that I was giving them. And for the longest time, they were actually getting cookies delivered to them on the same morning that they were baked. Wow. So that's when I was renting space from other companies. Okay. I'd have to go in and bake, and we'd pack it, and we'd deliver it just hours after they were baked. Wow. Yeah. Pr wow. Pretty wow. Huh? <laughs> now what we do is we bake the day before, okay. and my customers get them the very next morning. Okay. That's so so cool. they're still fresh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but how did your sales tactics change? When you finally moved into your own facility, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what were you then doing to sell? I mean, you must have had to be selling thousands of cookies. I was, you? yes, I, you know, I had to definitely increase the number of customers that I had. So before I made the move, I was out selling and giving out samples and picking up as many customers as I could. Just I, you? Just me. It's always been just me And selling. still going with the samples and giving people to taste Just it. the samples, yeah. Wow. Yeah, mostly cold calls wow. um, to the smaller cafes. Um, at some point, I discovered the food service world, okay. which is, um, I don't know if everybody knows this, but the big corporate cafeterias, mm -hmm are rarely managed by the company that they're serving. Those companies, let's say... Um, Hewlett Packard. Um, Hewlett Packard or General Electric. Um, Chevron. Chevron. They are, they hire a company who specializes in serving food, preparing serving food. To operate their... To operate their cafeterias. And so those are the companies that I do business with. Okay. Okay, so they they're my bread and butter. And how did you how did you how did you discover this? Accidentally. Okay. I was in downtown San Francisco looking for cafes and I walked into the Bechtel building right off Market Street, asked the security guard where their cafeteria was, went up there, luckily met a really nice woman named Jeanette who um, liked what I was showing her and so that was my first corporate cafeteria. And it was like Big. It was big. I'm going, oh my gosh, they're going to eat a lot of cookies here. And they did. And she, um, uh, upon my request, introduced my company to the other cafe managers in her company. So it was essentially you asked for a referral yeah. to these other folks. Yeah, I said, you know, Jeanette, who, you know, who else? What other places are, are run by your company that I could maybe take samples to? And so she helped me. Wow. She helped me, and that's how I discovered the food service world. Yeah. And that's what your primary, that's uh -huh. where you're, yeah. the biggest part of your business That's the from. biggest part of my business, absolutely. I still service the smaller cafes, um, and there are a few of these 
um, neighborhood cafes that do a tremendously large business. They might have several locations or they just might have a really good location where they do a big business in that one location. So in the corporate cafeterias, when people go in and they buy your cookies, are they branded with your name on them? Not always. Sometimes. Um, most of those cafes buy frozen cookie dough. Mm -hmm. And so they bake it fresh daily. Um, it doesn't, it probably does not have those cookies on it. Just saying, it just says cookies. I don't know what they have on it. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, you know, they have the list of ingredients. As long as they buy it from you. That's <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not too worried about it. I suppose if somebody said, what company do you get these cookies from, they would tell them. Right. So they're not going to say, oh, we make them. No, you know. <laughs> Then the, I have accounts that, that ask for baked and wrapped cookies. So we put our logo, the label on the cookie. Also, some of the places that sell the cookie dough will ask us for labels. So that when they bake it up, they put a label okay. on it. So even though they baked it, they will have a label on it that says those cookies. How much of your business is dough? More than 50%. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, um, that's the direction I'm going in is... I really want to focus on selling frozen cookie dough. Um, it's not as labor intensive. Um, it's more profitable. My customers get fresher cookies. So really your marketing program is all about having a good product that people can taste. Having a good product, we have really good service. I've got a great crew of people working for me. Um, without them, where would I be, right? Right. Um, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And once I'm established with the food service management company, as they grow, I grow. Mm -hmm. Almost always, they'll take me into every new account that they get. Oh, that's good. So it helps to have good and partners. And so, in you that. know, it's, it's like having a free sales team, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> I never quite looked at it that way, but they have their sales team that's always out there looking for new accounts. And if they get it, then I get it. So what was your first employee that you hired that was not baking? or helping make the cookies? It wasn't until I moved into my current location that I had people just working in the office. Doing what? Um, calling customers, printing out the reports for production, filing. Helping with administrative yeah, things. Yeah, all the stuff that happens in an office. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and that was how, it really. Uh, that was in 1993. Okay. So, yeah, you'd already been around for, for quite a while. And, mm -hmm. and uh, when you hired your first office employee, how many people did you have doing production? Oh, gosh. Six or seven? Wow, okay. Yeah. Well, that's, I, you know, I, just interesting for the, eight, the ratios. I'm not sure. A lot of folks that struggle with, well, when do I hire my first? Really long ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, I had. Drivers who just drove okay. part-time, and then I had production people who that's all they did, and then I had a, few, a couple of office people okay. when I moved over into the, the new space. Um, sometimes my drivers will want extra hours, and so we have, depending on the driver, put them out into production on off delivery days so they can pick up extra hours that way. I see. I think right now n all of my drivers are just drivers. They don't do, oh, except one. He does production on call once in a while. And when you started with drivers, did they start driving your vehicles or were they initially driving their own? Um, they initially drove their own. Wow. Yeah, when I was at Black Muslim Bakery, they drove their own. And I started picking up vehicles when I moved over um, to my first bakery at, at, uh, at Marina Way South. Okay. By the time I got over to my current location, um, I had all... Almost all of them were driving my vehicles. Right. So. And you had the insurance all worked out. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that was all worked out long ago. Yeah. We talked about marketing a little bit, but you did do the labels. Mm -hmm. And uh, initially, uh, you did your own labels. I did my own logos. You did your own logos. Yeah. Yeah, I designed and my own logos. We do have this here's, here. Here's the number one logo, the very first one. Okay. So, and uh, that's, that's my daughter. That's pretty much what she looked like when she was about two. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, on acetate, uh, it looks like. and uh, That's the original artwork, so that's what I made copies off of. You made copies from this one. Yeah. And so how did, how did, how did, you were telling me how you did this, which I'm, I, want, I want Oh, to know. okay. So I remember going to the art supply store and buying sheets of these different 
designs um, all of this stuff here and you can cut it up and paste it down and make whatever shapes that you want. And the letters too? And the letters too. I think, I God, I think I had to cut out, I had to take off each letter and, singly. And, 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 and paste it on? Stick it or, down and was make it the, sure the it's kind straight. You rubbed? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that, that's got to be what that was. <laughs> <laughs> you rubbed them on. This, yeah, is rubbed from, them on. this is from when? That was made in 19... Uh, 1982, maybe? Okay. I think. And how long yeah. did you use this logo? I used that until 86. Okay. And then you had uh, and then you had somebody designing your logos or No, and then I designed the second one and the third one. Okay. On on a computer. Uh second one was um I don't remember how I did the second one. Huh. Third one was on a computer. Okay. More recently, you're having a you're having a new logo, and yeah, I've got a really smashing new logo now. It's <laughs> I love it, and I love it so much. I actually hired somebody to do this for me, and he did a way better job than I could have ever done. <laughs> so I'm really happy with this new logo. And uh, yeah, you're 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 not sort of sad to see your old artwork no, going away. No, not at all. Not at all. No. Yeah. You feel it represents who you are. Yeah. And, uh, you know. So this is your new logo. And where, how are you going to use this? And, and why did you decide to? Why did you decide that you needed somebody to come in and do a logo for you? Well, initially, I um, one of the new things that I'm doing is I'm going to try breaking into the retail grocery market with um, a small box of pre-scooped cookie dough uh, to be put in the freezer section. And uh, when I hired a broker to do the sales for me, because he knows people in the field, so he can um, he can do a much better job than I could. Um, he introduced me to a graphic artist that he works with. They then both convinced me, although it was a little hard at first, that I really needed a new logo. If I wanted my product to jump off the shelves, I needed a logo that people would just not be able to miss, that they'd see it. It would stand out from everybody else. And so after some strong resistance on my part, um, Nick, the artist, convinced me. And he said, just let me show you. Let me just, and I said, okay, okay. So um, it took us a couple of weeks of him bringing, you know, a lot of different things to me and narrowing it down, picking the colors, and, um, and it works. They were right. They were both right. And so, of course, I can't have two logos. I can't have my old logo and this new one just for the retail. So it's branding. So if that's going to be in the retail market, then I need to change everything. So right. that means changing all of my current labels and my letterhead and the signs on my vans and all of that. But it's well worth it. Um, I just really, really love this new logo. It just it just pops so, out at you. So you were it's convinced. Great. Took a little resistance, but now you're yeah, happy. Yeah, yeah. So you know, let's talk about some of those things that might that you can think of going back that where you came to a point where you had a a, a big decision to make, mm -hmm. and um, you could have made it one way. You decided mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. uh, what was something that you think really changed your business that was a a good positive decision that you made? I think that there are a couple of things. Um, the really scary one for me was moving from a facility less than 1,700 square feet down the road to a larger facility. It, it just it destroyed my profit margin for a couple of years. And um, that, but being in a facility that gave me the room to grow was necessary. Right. So that was a big game changer for me right there. The other one I believe is focusing on, like I said earlier, focusing on um, a higher profit product, which is the frozen cookie dough. Was it a big decision to change how you were doing that? Or? It, you know, I, actually it wasn't, it wasn't a big decision. It sort of evolved over time. Like we're noticing the dough Purport percentage of the business is growing, and look, our profits go up as as the dough increases. Hello. <laughs> hmm. and, and so, and, so what's a, what's a what's a a thing that you wish you had decided differently at all these years? Something that maybe you look back on and you go, you know, I probably should have. 
Well, I could go way back mm -hmm. and wish that I had some education in business mm -hmm. because I had none. I was an art major in college, sculpture to be exact. Which didn't even help you with your logos. <laughs> no, but hey, I could sculpt a really nice cookie. cookie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that may have helped. Um, I really, really learned by the seat of my pants. Um, and there's still a lot of things that I don't, I don't know about business mm -hmm. that other people know. Right. And some, and sometimes they they can outpace me with their growth because they know certain things. So you know, I've I've just been kind of hanging in there at a certain level mm -hmm. for a while, and just recently I decided, okay, I'm tired of being stuck. So um, that's the reason for going into the retail stores. Um, I really want to take a big leap and really get this business growing. Okay. I'd, I'd like to see my frozen cookie dough nationwide in stores nationwide and upscale grocery stores all over the country is what I want to see. That's great. That's so great. so yeah. you're, you're, you've grown and you're still growing. Yes. You know, and this isn't the end of the Zoe cookie story. Right. You know, and the other thing that I've done differently mm. just recently brand new is I hired a food broker. Mm. Okay, I decided I, I can afford him because he's going to bring in a lot of money for me. Right. And so I can share that and give him a commission for doing that. Um, he knows people I don't know. He knows how that world works. I don't know how that world works. Right. Um, you know, what's necessary to get in and stay in. So um, that's the other big change that I made. Right. Early on with your big with your your business knowledge, how did you where, where did you go to get to get the knowledge or to get people to help you with it or what were some of the resources that you um, reached out to? I would ask questions of people. I had a uh, an informal business advisor for a while. A retired oh he's not really retired. Can't call him retired. He just works really hard still. Um, but um, he actually co-signed a loan for me oh, well. when I made the big move oh, right. and. Um, I'm not sure the bank would have given me the money if he hadn't co-signed. And he hooked me up with his banker who gave me the loan. So, um, I, yeah, I would seek help from knowledgeable people and um, just ask questions. And there are companies that were not necessarily my competitors. Mm -hmm. They were small businesses like myself. And so I would ask them questions like, what do you do when this happens? And how do you handle this? And what do you think? And right. That kind of thing. So you know, it's important to um, develop some relationships with other companies who okay. can help. So you had a mentor who helped you. Mm -hmm. uh, any particular any books that are significant that you would say that really? No, I. This is just me personally. Right. I have a really hard time reading those books. Uh -huh. I, I have a bunch. Right. Okay, and I'm going. Okay, I'm. You know, there's a lot of good information in here. And I would make it through the first couple of chapters, and again, that's just me. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, obviously, apparently, because these authors are successful and sell a lot of books, right. buy these books and read them. No, I've been helped by a number of books. Yeah. But, uh, um, any other other people, you know, um, speakers or anybody that were influences on you? Or? Um, people who have helped me have been purchasing directors. A purchase, purchasing director in particular um, at one of the food service corporations I sell to. Right. Um, he was just on my side, just like, you know, he did everything he could possibly do to keep me in the company and, and help me grow along with them. And um, he has since left the company and he's out consulting on his own and he's still behind me 100%. Wow. Still working with me. It's, so, customer advocates. Yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's so important to develop good, solid relationships with the people who are responsible for the success of your company, a customer. Mm -hmm. um, they're the decision makers mm -hmm. and the companies that buy from you. You really need to develop good relationships with them. So, and if it can turn into a friendship, it's even better. Right. So, and th this actually goes to another question I had about your products. Do you, when you decide, to, how do you decide to come out with another product? That's, is that based on what your customers are telling you? Or? Oh, well, I have customers always asking me, what do you have new? Do you have anything new? And so I make something new, 
Right. And um, sometimes it's successful and sometimes it isn't. Um, what I what I have found is that even though customers want a new something, mm -hmm. they still stick to the standards. The most popular cookies is what they order the most of. Right. I might have, uh, for instance, I have a delicious cookie called an orange pecan softy. It's like a really soft cookie dough. It's flavored with orange juice and orange extract, and wow. it has pecans in it and several kinds of dried fruit. It's a really good cookie. But I only have, you know, a certain group of customers who will order that cookie, even though it's delicious. And I'm reluctant to discontinue it because... First of all, I love the cookie, right. <laughs> <laughs> and and there are customers who love it. And so, is that your favorite cookie? It's not my favorite. I don't have a favorite. Oh, okay. My favorite changes from day to day. Although I'm a real chocoholic, I definitely like the chocolate chip cookies right. with the walnuts. That's that might be my favorite. And what's the most popular? The chocolate chip without nuts is the biggest seller that I have. And you have uh, now you were you were saying that you have a certain group that are the are the main sellers that are. Okay, chocolate chip mm -hmm. without nuts, oatmeal raisin, peanut butter, white chocolate chip, double chocolate chip, and snickerdoodle. Six flavors are the big sellers. And how many flavors have you made? I've got about 20 different flavors. Okay, so 20 different. Somewhere yeah. in there. I lose track. All right, so it's not quite an 80-20 uh, rule, but it's... I need to learn that. Everybody says, how many flavors do you have? And I'm, I never know. I yeah. think 20, 25, I don't know. <laughs> I need to go back and count it, and so I have a solid answer. I have 25. <laughs> And do you do any any uh, any market research to see what people what flavors people are interested in or like, or do no. you just wait until somebody else? No, I've never done or? market research. Uh. No. <laughs> but you go out. Lack of business training. I'm telling yeah. you, I just fly no focus by the seat groups. And... No. No. <laughs> no. Uh. None of that. I'm not suggesting that whoever is watching this and wants to get advice, the way I've done it is not the easiest way to do it. Right. It's just what I did out of necessity, but and tenacity. It sounds like tenacity and determination, and you know I had a child to support, and so I was not going to let myself fail. Um, I, I have seen other companies who quit. Mm -hmm. They were in the food industry, and they they just quit because they weren't doing well enough. They weren't making enough money. They didn't have a child. They didn't have that. I have to make this work thought in their head mm -hmm. that I did. So they just quit doing the food and they went and got another job. Right. Well, I imagine that would be most people's reaction when the police department comes to your front door <laughs> and tell you. And the health department. Health department. Right. To tell you that you cannot be doing this anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You'd go, oh, okay. You yeah. know, it was a good try, but yeah. that's way too much work yeah. to get into, you know. Yeah. I've been advised to file for bankruptcy a couple of times when I hit really hard times um, during this latest recession. I honestly didn't know if my company was going to survive. I said, well, this is it. This is it. Yeah, what'd you do? I borrowed money for three years. Wow. And I was at the point where I had no credit left. Wow. There was no place that I could go to borrow any more money. It's all on your personal credit. It's on credit cards it's like, yeah, wow. and home equity loan. Wow. Yeah. yeah so you, you put it all out I there. I put everything on the line. Wow. To keep the company going, I have all these employees who depend on me. Right, that makes a difference. And this is all I know how to do. What else am I going to do, right? <laughs> Go get a job somewhere. Oh no! Baking cookies. I don't think so. <laughs> so lucky for me, the economy started improving when I just before I reached the end of the line as far as borrowing. Wow. And so now um, we're in we're in the debt payoff phase. We're going to be we're going to have all that debt paid off very soon. That's great. Very soon. And, but you really felt that the business com was complete. Your business, you really felt the effects of the economy. Yes, you know, and that's not the first time. This is probably the third time this has happened. Yeah, we've had a couple of, mm -hmm. of these. Yeah. Really big downturns because I sell to Silicon Valley type companies, right? right. When they're impacted, and they lay off a bunch of employees. It just goes right on down the line. That's right. And now yeah. Silicon Valley is going through a little boomlet. Yeah. And so that's that, that's pretty good. Exactly. But it probably is make, it makes a good good sense to diversify into these mm -hmm. into these markets too, because mm -hmm. then you kind of aren't so dependent on one right. one right. industry. Exactly. So, um, do you, how often do you get out where your customers are tasting the where people are actually eating the cookies and get their reactions these days? Oh. I will go to one of the cafes that sells my stuff, I don't know, a couple times a month. 
and uh, they don't always know who I am. Right. And so sometimes I'll say, hey, I'm Zoe. I sell you these cookies. And they're all, you're Zoe. Oh, my God. Hey, 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 here's Zoe. She's the one who makes the cookies. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have your autograph? <laughs> It's <laughs> really funny. Wow. Well, that's great. That's great. So, so you do get it. It's nice to get the good reaction. From, I love it. Yeah. yeah, I love it. And there are times when I also do free demos. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the food service cafeterias, I'll take, they'll ask for a demo every once in a while. Okay. Where I'll go in and I'll cut up samples of cookies and mm -hmm. spend a lunch time handing them out to people. So you've always been in the wholesale business. Yes. And what made you decide to go that route rather than have a cookie shop? Well, I think what made me decide to go that route is that's how I started mm -hmm. in my house, right? I can't sell cookies out of my house. Right. Uh, and so I just continued along that road. I thought about a retail shop for a while. The reason I decided not to go there is the rents are very high. A shop like that is dependent on foot traffic. And so you've got to get a really good location. Mm -hmm. And I just decided no. Then you're really in the restaurant business, in a sense. In a sense. So because I started out learning the business through wholesale, I just continued on with that. Okay. It just was a natural thing. Yeah, it felt natural to me. I felt like I had more control because customers were my responsibility to find. And so I could go out and find my customers rather than waiting for them to find me. So how have your goals changed over the years? You know, when you first started out, what were you expecting of your company? What were you saying? Wow, if I could make it, I'd, be, I'd do this. And then... My goal was to retire at the age of 50. Okay. I missed it by many years. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how many. Okay. <laughs> but you thought, you, you, thought you, you, always, you started off with the vision of building a big mm -hmm. cookie business. Mm-hmm. Okay. And retiring at the age of 50. Oh, wow. Okay. And, uh, well. Not yet. Yeah. Things out of my control. <laughs> Economy. The goal is the same. The, the goal is the, the goal same. Is the same. <laughs> the, to retire one day. Right. The, the, <laughs> the age is different. Okay. So, you know, I was just wondering if it had expanded from, look, if I could just make my rent, if I can just, you know, you know. But no, you, you always had the... I always wanted to retire at 50, and okay. I really thought I could do it. Okay. Well, if it hadn't been for a couple bumps along the way, maybe. Yes, but, you know, that's just the way the economy is, and it's always going to be that way. And, right. And here's, here's the thing. I truly believe that had I had, uh, had I been better capitalized mm -hmm. and had some sort of business education mm -hmm. in addition to my art, I could have hired people who knew more than I did who could have helped grow the business more quickly. Mm -hmm. On, in that case, I may have been retired by now. I see. Okay. Right. But I was always undercapitalized. I couldn't hire those people, and I didn't know how to do it the right. way those people would have known how to do it. And so that was, that's what has delayed my dream. Right. And so if I could give any specific piece of advice to young entrepreneurs, it is to f somehow be well capitalized and hire the right people. You, you might not make much money, you might have to pay them more right. than you're making yourself, um, but eventually that's gonna flip around and they'll be well worth what you've paid them. That's uh, interesting advice. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, being well capitalized is hard unless you're. It's you know, really hard, especially I mean, in the, you know this economy these days. Yeah. So, um, did you never got very much into the whole internet sales or any of that kind of stuff? Did you? No, ever? no. I considered internet sales for a while, and I changed my mind very quickly because that's baking, mm -hmm. packaging, not only just for wholesale customers, but now we're talking about intensive packaging so that items get there unbroken. Right. right. That's what I want to get away from. Right. Actually, you're going in completely the opposite All right. direction. Now, yes, I could make twice as much because I can sell it for twice as much. I'd be selling it at retail prices right. instead of wholesale. Regardless, I just don't want to do the work. Right. I don't right. want to do that work. Right. That's not the part that interests you. No. Other people are doing that. There are hundreds of companies doing that. I want to stay with what I know. Right. 
and uh, I, I believe that the direction I'm going is, is going to take me to my ultimate goal. Well, thanks for taking the time to tell us about going into the, in detail about uh, your, the story, your story. You're welcome. I had a good time remembering all those things. <laughs> thanks a bunch. And I yes. just happen to have brought you all something. Yes, we've been smelling them. <laughs> and so uh, these are these are these your... these are six of my flavors. Okay, the yeah. six the six most popular ones. No, not no, not well. Some of them are the most popular. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yes. I'll say yes to that. Okay, sure. Well, we'll <laughs> we'll definitely be enjoying these shortly. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. See ya.